So, okay, in today's session, we will basically try to cover mo Drupal module development as much as we can. And um, we'll start with very basics of what a Drupal module is, what it does. So the beginnings of it will be a little bit of theoretical knowledge and then followed by obviously a lot of practical implementation. So first of all, let's create a, an empty site, completely empty site. So what I'll do is, I'm in the, my sites directory, I say drush site install, and then I give it a db URL of MySQL. My username is root, and I have no password, so nothing, at localhost, and then I will call my site d7 scratchpad. Okay. And then that's, and then, oh yeah, sites sub dir is something I have to specify. And I will call it scratch pad. So this will create a subdirectory called scratch pad and a database called d7 underscore scratch pad. Because my root user has no password, all that is, is possible. Otherwise I would have to specify dbsu and dbsu pw. So root user and is password. All that is unnecessary because this is my local setup. I don't need a password on root user. All right, let's go. So it's saying that it's going to create the files directory and all that good stuff, and it's going to um, create the database. Do you want to continue? Yes. So with this, I should have a, an empty Drupal site, right? I have already uh, set up my um, DNS name in etc host, localhost.d7.scratchpad, and I suffix it with dot .scratchpad so that it automatically maps to the scratchpad, site scratchpad, without me doing anything special. One thing that I do have to do manually is make this files directory ch group to www data that's because uh, with the web server and php server runs as www data that's one thing and second thing is i'm going to uh, delete styles from it which is not owned by www data and finally i'm going to ch mod g plus s so basically set gid bit automatically on files so that all future files that are ever created in files will be owned by www data. Okay, with that in place, I can actually visit my site. And when I visit my site, it's an empty Drupal scratchpad site. Okay, I can log in with admin and admin. And I'm logged in. And it is the standard empty site. Now, as you know, I like to, I don't use the standard ones. The modules, there are certain modules that I like to use. I disable some that I don't like and enable some that I do like. So dis bad and end good. These are drush. Um, oops, hold on. Um, sorry, something went wrong. I did not. I have to create a, a directory structure here, which I did not do. Let me do that. Um, make the directory writable and then mkdr minus p modules contrib modules custom modules features scripts libraries themes okay now i can remove the right permission and once again do the disable bad modules enable good modules this time, because I have modules contrib created here, it will be able to download the right modules that I like. All right, so, okay. So I got an empty site. Let's generate some content, configuration, development. Uh, we'll just generate some, I, I, don't, I don't know if I really need to generate content. In fact, I won't generate content. Let's jump straight to module development. So here I have, um, my NetBeans ready to code against this site. 
So here's the scratchpad site and it has a modules custom. Let's create a new module. We'll call it my mod for now. So a new folder. Uh, I like to do that uh, new folder my mod. So a Drupal module, first of all, is a is a collection of code. The collection of code has a declaration file, a manifest file called dot info. It's a descriptor. It's a it's a declaration like manifest file. Okay, it describes the module. So that's the dot info file, and then the code of the module sits in a dot module file. And then there are a bunch of dot ink files also. So let's start. So here I am creating a module whose machine name is my mod, but the name of the folder could be anything. It doesn't have to be my mod, but obviously it's uh, it will be strange if it was called something else. So now my module is really defined by the info file. So I am creating an empty file called my mod dot info, and this is an empty file. Once I do that, I there are a few required attributes in info file. Info file's uh, format is not PHP. It's sort of like uh, INI file, but not exactly. So you say name equal to the human name. I will call it my module uh, description. This is optional, but you know, my demo module to show how to do and Drupal module development. Hmm? Okay, now core version is required. You have to say 6.x, 7.x, 8.x, whatever. And then you may have dependencies. So I am going to specify a dependency. And dependencies are multiple, so they're, therefore they are signified by empty square brackets behind. And uh, that means you're adding appending to the list of dependencies that's already there. And I'm going to uh, depend on the devel module. Why? Because I'm going to use DPM for printing messages. So let's save that. Once we save that, we can go to the site modules. We have not even created um, we have not created the my module yet. Oh, sorry, the dot module file. So I guess, yeah, it doesn't show up. Oh, maybe I should flush all caches and see. Um, okay, I guess it won't show up until I have a dot module file. So let's create a dot module file, new empty file, and we'll call it my mod dot module. And I will put a, to make it a valid PHP file, I have to do this, just this. So I save this. Let's see if this helps. Uh, reload. Yep, that showed up. So now, so that means you have, you need to create a module. The minimum you need is an info file and a dot module file dot module can even be mostly empty except for the opening PHP tag. Info file has to have name, core, and depend um, if dependencies are needed. Uh, dependency and description are both optional. Okay, so now if I enable my module, nothing really happens if when I enable my module because the module has no code. So without code, you, I mean the module does, is not going to do anything. So the first thing you want to do is why? why what is mo let's talk about what is module and wh why do we have them? Drupal has the policy that all code will be executed by Drupal, um, and uh, Drupal will call any external code that it deems appropriate. It will not uh, allow anyone else to you know, inject itself into the Drupal workflow without Drupal meaning to do so, without Drupal allowing to do so. So you don't call Drupal, Drupal calls you at the right time. And at the right time is the keyword here, that right time is when Drupal is ready to execute a hook implementation. So Drupal declares 
And this is not just Drupal core, even extension modules can declare their own ho hooks. Contributed modules can declare their own, own hooks. So once you are injected into Drupal's workflow, you can declare your own hooks. So obviously it all starts with Drupal core declaring some hooks, other modules implementing those hooks, and then they in turn can de declare their own hooks. Okay, so let us, uh, so the one hook, you can find out all kinds of hooks by visiting this website, api.drupal.org. And in this search box, just type hook underscore, and you'll see a ton of hooks. So the hook I am going to uh, implement first, the easiest, simplest, most gen generic hook is hook init. Hook init basically uh, executes on every non-cached page request, which unless you're using page, uh, caching, it will be non-cached in general. So hook in it is a hook that is invoked by Drupal on every request that it handles, that Drupal handled, handles, okay? Now you may say, but mm, of course Drupal handles every request, doesn't it? But no, not really. If your web server is set up, it is configured to do caching, then it, may not pass on some of the requests to Drupal. So that's why, but in any case, since we are using a simple setup with, without any caching, we can simply use hook init. Hook init is, is a hook that will be implement, executed at the beginning of a request. So let's implement this hook. Now, let me reiterate. So let me write first this comment, implements hook init. Okay, so that's a, a doc comment. And Drupal declares the hook in it, and you are supposed to mm, copy this as is, paste it, say the word function in front of it, and replace the word hook with the machine name of your module. That's important. Okay, so now that's your implementation of hook in it. Obviously, hook in it at this point does, doesn't do anything. So what we will do is we will just um, print something. We will say hello, dpm hello, okay? Or we could print the, the incoming request that we are getting. So let's do that instead. We say dollar get. So that's the request array, the get request array. Uh, and then uh, we will say, we'll put a label on it, get. Okay, so dpm now, is a is, stands for devel print message, I think. Mm, it's a function that is provided by the devel module, and that is exactly why I made the module depend on devel, so that devel is a dependency, and that means DPM will be available. Okay, so m m let's run this. In order to run it, all we have to do is just reload any page. Let's go to front page. We don't see anything. Why don't we see anything? Because the this module is already enabled and a new hook implementation has been introduced into the system. Drupal caches every hook in order to have better performance and speed. So therefore, it does not look for new hooks on every request. In order to tell Drupal to, to you know, drop the cache and look for new hook implementations, we have to flush all caches. So once we flush all caches, immediately the our hook in it starts running so if i now um, refresh the page any number of times every time the hook implementation runs the hook in it runs and hook in it simply dpms the dollar get dollar underscore get array okay so that's hook in it so this is the simplest hook you can implement it's very simple there's not even a signature you don't return anything you just you like to do okay so this was just for demo purposes let's uh, get rid of this Im hook implementation let's actually implement a very popular very important hook which basically will allow us to place a page at say my mod page one so if i currently do my mod page one i get this error 404 error page not found let me save this 
I so I, I, I removed my hook in it, so now it's not running anymore. But I still get page not found because I am trying to visit a page that doesn't exist. So look at this path, my mod slash page. That is the that is the path that we want to implement. We want to return a page from that path. So we call this a route, also known as URI or path or so many different names, but I call it a route. Okay, to, Im to implement a page at a given route, what you need to do is implement hook menu. So hook menu, that's the hook you need to implement. So when you visit and see, there are lots of things, but the main thing, so I'll just start implementing. As a function, like always, I will copy this signature. Say function, paste the name of the hook, and then replace the word hook with the machine name of the module. Okay, and then from this, if you look at the documentation, it will say that you are supposed to return items. So from this function, I return an array called items. These items are menu path items. Of course, right now it's an empty array. So let's populate the array. I say items. And then the key of the array will be the path that you want to implement, the route that you want to implement. So copy that and paste it here. So there, that's the path and the value, that's the key. And then the value is a data structure, basically a PHP array that in turn has other keys and values. Let's handle them one at a time. So the first, the single most important item in there is page callback. So page callback is basically the name, literally the stringified name of the PHP function that will return the body of the page. So that, and so that's required. So I will call this, uh, now this will be the name of the function. Um, the, the name, let's say I write a function called my mod page one, and then I can return a string from it. This is page one. Okay, that's it. The only problem with this is when I have the name of the function is my mod underscore page one, somebody might confuse it as if this was a hook because remember hooks have hook underscore uh, page one. This could be a hook called hook underscore page one. So in order to remove that confusion, I prefix my function with underscore. And that is once I have established that function name, I copy that and paste it into page callback. Okay, so let's start here. Now, let me review basically. This is your route, the my mod slash page one, and then you have to specify a page callback, page space callback key, which will be the stringified name of the function that returns the body of the page. Okay, let's save this and refresh. Obviously refresh doesn't do anything because we introduce a new hook. And as you know, Drupal caches hooks. So in order to tell Drupal to find the new hook, we have to flush all caches. We flush the caches and look, we have a different problem now. This is no longer 404 page not found. This is access denied. Why are we denied access? That's because Drupal by default, uh, uh, does security checks and it, whatever its default is, it decided that I am not allowed to access this page. So to get around that, I as had another key called access callback. Access callback is the name of a function and by default it is user underscore access and that's a long story. So I'll make it simple and short for you and say, replace your access callback simply with the Boolean true. So when you set your access call callback to Boolean true, 
uh, you will it will basically allow everyone not just admin but anonymous and everyone else to access this so now we save that try to reload doesn't work because it is still cached so this time instead of flushing all caches we can own we can decide we have not introduced a new hook so we don't have to flush all caches but we have modified a menu path a menu entry menu item that is so we have to flush the menu cache at least and there you go this is page one and you can see that it is showing page one I um, mean the return value the return string from that page callback the page callback is the one that returns a hard-coded string and that becomes the body of the page all right recap that's the route my mod slash page one you implement hook menu let me put a comment there implements hook menu and here we can just say page callback for my mod page one like that hmm? so so basically this is the route that we are we are trying to implement and we specify a page callback which is the name of the function here's that function we do have to say access callback and we have to set it to something we set it to true so that it's completely open for anybody to access finally from our function we turn a hard coded string okay next let us give a title to this page so that it shows up here at the top so if i give title and is a key and then the value will be the hard coded title so this will be um, let's call it page one i have to give now one thing you should notice is that this is a hard coded string but it is not a, a translatable string we do not wrap it into t normally any any string that shows up in the drupal ui you are supposed to make it translatable by wrapping it in t uh, t function but this one you don't and the reason is that Drupal itself calls the T, uh, the translator function on it. So that's a longer and more deeper subject. So we'll we'll skip that. But I just that's something I wanted to point out. Okay, once you do that, you reload. Again, reloading doesn't bring your title on the page because it is all still you you made a change to menu item. You must flush the menu cache. All right, that's it. We got page one. That's good. So that's the title. It came about because we added this key. All right. This, uh, so you, what, what if you had two pages? Well, it's pretty easy. You just copy this and then let's say we create a page two. What if you want to do it for infinite or like hundreds of pages? Would you have to do it? Many times. Well, so the question is, what if we wanted to do this for hundreds of pages? Well, if those hundreds of pages have something in common with each other, then no, you could write a function that responds to a pattern of URL and then uh, does something based on that pattern. Yeah. But if those hundred pages are completely unique, then of course, yes, you you do have to. But usually, you do have to, uh, so. So yeah, in fact, I, let me. It's a very good question. So let me instead implement a generic one, page percent. What this will do is, so it's, it brings us to a very good question basically. What if you had a parameter, a variable value in that place? So which means we will create my mod slash page slash any number here. And that number we will use, um, so this title we will keep generic like this page generic let's see but page callback we will say page generic that's our, our page callback and 
we create a new function called underscore my mod page generic and for now before we proceed we'll say, just say this is the generic page so at this point we haven't done anything special other than just add a slash percent to the end of my mod page uh, everything else is similar to the previous cases let's start with this and then we will I will explain what to do with this percentage sign okay so if I again flush the menu cache and page one of course runs but if I go to page slash one two three it does take me to page generic that's good right the problem is it doesn't do anything with one two three so let's see what we can do with one two three that extra argument we this can be turned into a page a an argument of the page callback so if i say put a um, dollar num as an argument and then i say this is generic page dollar num or this is this is the page number dollar num that the the problem is that we do have to this dollar num has to be passed in here it's an it's an argument of page callback so we say page argument and in the value of page argument we say and we say because arguments sorry not sing it's plural you can have multiple arguments and because it is going to be multiple therefore it's an array and now in here in the array you can give hard coded values let's say hard coded Let's start with that so let's see what happens now now that we have an argument called hard-coded string this dollar num will become hard-coded let's see if it even works so flush the menu cache and there you go dollar num is hard-coded that's not what we wanted we wanted one two three there right so we replace the no, we don't replace it with percent. We replace it with the positional position of this. We count this as zero, this as one, and this as two. The third position is two. So we say array two. So this is a little bit strange thing. When it is a string, it is taken literally as is. But when it's a number, it it interprets that as a positional parameter which is whatever value is in this position number two remember it starts counting at zero then one and then this is two let's save this see if this works there you go one two three whatever you put here will show up here let's try a different number four five six and that's four five six so this is a very very useful trick where you can um, you can basically pass parameters from the URL path let's we can pass two parameters actually another one second one and now we say position two and position three are the arguments of course, to pass these arguments, you have to actually declare a second argument here, and we will say dollar str. Let's say second one is a string, and then we can say str is dollar str. Okay. So what I did was now it's looking for two parameters in the URL path parameters, and let's see what happens. Uh oh, I made a mistake somewhere. So line 30 has an error. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, I forgot to close the parentheses. Save that. Reload. 
Okay, now the page is not found. Why is it not found? Because there's only one parameter. Exactly. So there is only one parameter. So I say four, five, six, and foo. Now it works. Percent first percentage sign is four, five, six. Second percentage sign is foo. What if you wanted it to work with or without um, the percentage sign? What you do is you remove the percentages, and you still keep array two and three. <laughs> so now what happens is it will because in Drupal every path also cap answers to its subpaths. In case a subpath does is specific more specific sub route doesn't exist, it will the parent route will handle the sub sub route. So you accept zero, one, or two. So you can put uh, uh, so if you in your path you say my mod page followed by anything else, it will still be captured by my mod page. Okay, so that's one good thing. But then you can still capture these arguments two and three, and if they are not present, they will be passed in as null. So what we can do is we can give them default values. So let's say the default value for num is zero, and default value for string is um, not uh, nothing. Okay, let's just say nothing for the word. So now. If I go back here and I say flush all caches menu, it works. But if I remove these parameters completely, then it says, oops, it doesn't say anything. Hold on, let me see. Um, it didn't do what I th thought it would do. Mm -hmm. So, Actually, let me remove the page arguments. So I commented that out. And now, of course, because I changed the menu item, I have to flush the menu cache. Ah, now it worked. So, sorry, I made a mistake. I kept array two and three. I shouldn't have. Uh, so Drupal tries to manufacture those arguments, which we don't want. We want them to be passed in as, when, when those arguments, so what happens is, automatically extra arguments after the the page route anything that is extra gets gets passed in automatically as parameters of the page callback okay all right so that's a lot about so you 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 do need to be very very aware of percentage sign this and that right let's say if you said that first first parameter is absolutely required second one is not so then you can say, you can put a percentage sign there. And then you can say page arguments only two, just that. So now if I flush the caches, so page is not found because first argument is absolutely required. I say one, two, three. And then one, two, three is passed. This is the first argument, percent sign. And second one, which is not specified even, is optional. That's why it defaults to nothing. I could I could specify something if I wanted, and then it does gets passed. So this is a very flexible system, very very useful system. In fact, there are even better cases of this, which we will see. What if this number one two three? or the uh, second argument str were to be transformed in some manner. What if one, two, three was a node ID and you were supposed to load that node and use the node instead? That would be fun, right? So let me show you how to do that. First, let us apply that to the second parameter. Well, let's, let's apply that to first parameter, why not? Hmm? Um, what we do is we, this percentage sign is to be replay, uh, is, is given a suffix called, you, you make, make up your own suffix. We will make a suffix called square. So you basically, instead of saying percent, you say percent square. When you make it percent square, it is going to look for a loader called named square underscore load. It just, 
assumes that there is a function named square underscore load it will pass the the actual number one two three through this function and whatever it re returns is what will be used for dollar num okay so let me show what, uh, the example so we i have to write a function called square let me let me see what happens if i don't specify anything it will probably fail pretty badly page not found it didn't even find the page because it didn't find square uh, the lo square uh, underscore load so i have to create the function called square load and then incoming will be and the incoming number okay and then re you return let's say dollar num star dollar num square of the number okay once i do that what will happen is you will pass 1 2 3 yes. the number 1 2 3 will pass through this square underscore load it'll get squared i don't know the square of 123 and then that is the squared 123 which will be passed into the page callback let's see what happens ah look at that page generic this page this is the page number 15129 so if i try to find i'm sure that's the square 123 times 123 is 15129 correct so so this is this is called a loader function i i think of it like a translator function you come in with one value and that value get, it gets passed to the translator function gets translated and then the resulting value is what is passed to the page callback this is very useful let me show you how useful this can be what if uh, like i said you wanted to show something about a node let's say the title of a node or something and this was a node id first of all we don't have any nodes so let's go to the front page and create some nodes so we just say devel generate and we'll create some articles, 50 articles should be enough. And uh, generate. So now when we go to the front page, we have a bunch of articles. Good. So this is node 34. We have everything from node one to 50, right? That's good. Let's now go to our other page where we were doing our experiments. Now, instead of squaring, we will use the number as a node id if you want to use the number as node id you can again you can just say percent no loader function and then you use your um i mean let's go back to percent so there is no loader function and the you, you rename your argument to nid that would make sense, right? Need it. That's the node ID you're receiving. And we basically do dollar node equals node underscore load. And then give it the node ID. Node load will load the node for you, right? And then we will, uh, we will say, we can set the title. Let's set our own title. And we can call Drupal set title. So this will allow us to set our title and we'll set it to node title. So whatever the title of the node is, we'll just do that. And now of course page number doesn't make any sense now anymore. So now what we are doing is somebody is passing us a generic number. We are taking that number. Of course, we pass in the number to the page callback. We take that number, load a node based on that, assuming that it's a node ID, and then take uh, uh, the title of that node and ma make it the page's own title. Let's see. You don't have to make a percent node. I will do that. If I make it percent node, it will use node load automatically. And I wanted to show you how, how to do it without that first, the hard way. So let's do it the hard way. So I reload this. 
So basically, it tried to load something for 123. Of course, there is no node ID 123. So let's just do 1212. Okay. Um, I think um, I need to clear caches. Okay. You see that title? That is the title of node 12. If I say node 34, let's say, that's the title of node 34. If I say node 12 again, I get the 12 title. I go back to 34, I get that. So this is Drupal, Lo not Drupal, but your code loading the node for you, right? You, you assume you are getting a node ID and you turn that into a node. But Drupal can do this for you much easier. And for that, you just have to, say, instead of saying percent, you say percent node. Now it will call this function node underscore load. Remember, just like it was calling square underscore load, it will call that. And then you don't have to do any, what you are receiving now is no longer a node ID. It is a node. So you just say node and you don't no longer have to do this translation so what you're receiving is a node okay because you in your path you said percent node all right so now let's flush caches and the whole thing works exactly the way it was supposed to in fact you are receiving an entire node to to see that you can simply say dpm dollar node and then give a label of node save this and now when you reload you see the whole node okay so this is basically the loader functions in hook menu you can go much further than this let us before we go f very far let's actually look at this access callback Okay, so, so far we took the easy way out. We simply said access callback is um, true, which means everyone is allowed. Let's restrict it a little bit, right? So, uh, we can, we can basically, um, let's see. Let's look at some permissions. So what I want to tell you is by default, when you don't specify true, the access callback defaults to user, user access. Now user access is a, is a Drupal API function. Let's see what it, what it does. So I can go to api.drupal.org and look up user access. So user access takes one string that is the name of the permission, such as administer nodes and so on and so forth. What this will do is, the second argument is optional, and that is to check that permission for which account, which user account. By default, when you don't specify the second argument, it assumes the currently logged in user, which kind of makes sense, right? But you can check the access permissions for a given user account that you supply. But if you don't supply, it will take your logged in user, which, which obviously is what we will use. So because the default access callback is user access, but it does need a second a, 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 a first, first parameter, some argument. So you have to say access argument arguments. And since it's plural arguments, you have to give an array. And then the f argument is going to be the name of the permission the machine name of the permission. So we'll use this one uh, from administer nodes, uh, the, the one from the example. So this is the name of a permission. Now I'll explain in a second. I do not specify the second parameter because I want the logged in user to be who's to be the, the account whose permission is checked. So I, if I s save this and I go back to this and, and flush all caches, it continues to work for me, except that it won't work for an anonymous user. So if I copy this and look at a not logged in session, I, I open an incognito window and go there and it says access denied. If I, to, if I go back to the way things were, 
which is uh, access callback equal to true, right? And then I clear cache, and then go back to my anonymous session, reload, I can see it. I don't see DPM because I don't have access. Anonymous user cannot see DPMs, um, at least not by default, unless you give them permission. But I do see the page, and I see the proper title and the string. When I go back into code and bring back the access callback of user access, or even if I, I can even delete the access callback or just let's co comment it out. What this means is take the default access callback, which already is user underscore access. Let me show you, save, flush all caches. Obviously everything continues to work for the admin user, but for anonymous user, access is denied. Because it, because Drupal said, to decide your, to determine your access, I will uh, run this function called user underscore access, pass it the first parameter of administer nodes and check. Well, since I'm not logged in, I, if I go to people permissions and look for administer nodes, okay, wait. You see, administer content. Unfortunately, uh, Drupal uses this human name in the UI. Internally, it is using the machine name to check. This is, this is a little bit strange, but to check the machine name, you inspect element, and in there, on the checkbox basically, and in there you will see the value is exactly the name of the permission that we were using. So this is the machine name of the permission, Unfortunately, Drupal doesn't expose that in the UI anywhere. Well, I guess it's not supposed to because you're a developer, you are supposed to go behind the scenes and figure out the machine name of the uh, permission. So if I now allow anonymous user the ability to administer content, so I'm checking this checkbox immediately. Back here, now that the user Anonymous user can administer content. If I refresh the page, I'm able to see. If I want to uh, see the devel uh, message also, then I go to anonymous user and check that checkbox. And now DPM will start showing up <laughs> for anonymous users. So again, I mean, that's not how, what you should do. So I will uh, turn it off. You, you don't want to show internal developer information to anonymous users. And also the administer content, you don't want to allow anonymous users to start administering content. So I uncheck both of these. And once you do that, uh, the anonymous user is denied access. So let's see uh, if I wanted to introduce my own permission. Meaning say define a new permission that, that my own module respects. So that's very easy. You create a new hook called hook permission, okay? So let me go to api.drupal.org and look for hook permission. In Drupal 6, this was called hook perm, but now it's called hook permission. So there, hook permission basically returns an array of permissions, note the plural. So as usual, I'm going to copy the signature exactly because I don't want to make any mistake in either the name of the hook or in the, in the parameter list. I replace the word hook with my mod and what I return from it is permissions or let's call it perms. And then in the perms, I have the machine name and we will call it use my mod, <laughs> okay. So this is, or, or let me say, or view my mod 
generic page. How about that? Okay, that's the machine name. And then the value will be a data structure that will say title equals whatever. And that will be uh, the human value view my mod generic page. I just capitalized view and put a period at the end. <laughs> I don't know if period is convention. Let me say, see, it might not be the convention. No, uh, description has period, but not the name. Title doesn't. So I say, yeah, and then I can give it a description. Oh, lowercase. And this can be. This should be a, a few sentences. So say blah, blah. Okay. So if you save this and go to your page, and of course you will have to flush cache because without that, Drupal will not notice that a new hook was introduced. And this point, I can say my module. You see, that's my module, and it says the title of the permission is view my mod generic page and then the description is blah blah and I'm going to allow anonymous user but not the administrator and authenticated user just for fun right to do that so I save permissions at this point if I reload this page nothing happens because my user x and the access argument is still administer nodes so what I should do is instead give the machine name of the permission, this one, and paste it here. So now view my more generic page. Whoever has access to this permission called view my more generic page is the only one who, is, who can see that page. So once you do that, reload, oh, I do have to flush cache. Right, flush all cache. And now go to my anonymous session and look. Anonymous user is able to view that page. But the fun part is admin will not be able to now anymore. I'm just hitting back, back, back. Okay. So if I reload this, hmm. Okay, admin is able to? Why? I thought it, the ad, that admin won't be able to, but let me check why. People permissions, my module. Uh, you see, uh, administrator is unchecked. Hmm. There must be something where administrators are allowed everything, anything. So, yeah, must be uh, that. So if I if I create a, an authenticated user, let me just do that. So if I go to development, generate users, and I'll just create one user. And the name of that user is whatever this is. Okay, and now if I, in my, I say you drush user login, that username. And it gives me this link. I will use this link to log in as that user. Copy. And in my anonymous window, I will log in as that user. There you go. I'm logged in. Now if I go to the page that I was looking at, access de is denied. Because the uh, I'm authenticated. And when I was not authenticated, I was allowed access. But I am authenticated and I'm not allowed access. Why? Because of this, uh, sorry. Because in the permissions, I said, that authenticated is, user is not allowed. Administrator is, it looks like is, is exempt from that. So I, I check the authenticated user, save permissions, 
and as soon as I do that, here when I'm logged in as the regular <coughs> user, I reload this page and I can see stuff. I can see the page. Okay, so this is what I wanted to, sh uh, this is enough about access ma um, callback and access arguments. So, okay, let's keep going. We have a lot to cover. We need to talk about forms. Okay, how to present forms, what to do with them, etc. So for that, I will create a whole new uh, module. I'll call it mm, to do. Okay, so this is a module called to do. And in that, I will create an empty file uh, to do dot info and another empty file to do dot module. Okay. So in the info, I say name is my to do list. And uh, description I'll skip. Core is 7.x. And no dependency. Oh, well, let's depend on devel. Dependencies. Devel. Right, let's start with this. And then the module has PHP, right? And we will start from the beginning. We will implement function um, to do menu. So hook menu we are implementing. Return dollar items. I'm going faster this time because you've already seen all this. And I say dollar items. You just want to see your to do. You just go to path to do. And in the path to do, what do you have? You have a page callback. It's going to be, uh, I, again, I put underscore in front of it because it's not a hook, underscore to do list. And then access callback. Again, since I've already shown you, I'll, for now I'll just make it true so that anybody can get to it, okay? And um, we will give a title of my to do list okay that's all we will do and then we write the function for page callback to do underscore list from this we return um, return some HTML I guess uh, so the HTML the only HTML I will return for now will be um a link so drupal has a built-in function called l for presenting links for returning links so i say the text of the link is create a new to do create to do let's say and then the path to that will be to do slash new so what it is doing, L function, the L function simply takes a two parameters. One is the label, the title of the link, and then second is the URL of the path of the link. This can be an absolute URL, or it can, when it doesn't start with a slash or anything, it's a path within Drupal, okay? Obviously this to do slash new doesn't actually exist yet. We'll start here. Save it, let's enable Brush minus y en to do. Okay, so once we do that, I got in navigation menu, I got a link my to do list. What I did not tell you last time was, but by default, hook menu items end up in navigation menu as menu item links. You can change that, and we probably will change that, but let's click on this my to do list. I got a title, my to-do list, and I got a link, create to-do. So you need to understand what happened here. I returned, so this L function simply returned me an, me HTML. And I simply returned that HTML back to, as the body of the page. Okay? All right, so this creates a page that returns, the whole entire body of the page is simply one link. 
but you typically don't want to do that you want to show um, the list of to do's followed by you know create to do and all that so to do that what I'll do is I will let's say if I, I'll first fake fake the list of to do's so I want to say ul or li rather um, ol ordered list you know li1 li2 and then end the list and then end the order list sorry list okay the problem is how do i return two things <laughs> i cannot return two right you cannot return twice so therefore what you do is you combine these two items into a single render array that's the new term you need to remember render array so what you are you are really supposed to return from page callbacks are not html strings in any case you are supposed to return render arrays to begin with so how do you construct a render array let's call this dollar page it's an array and well no need and then you say dollar page uh, i will say list equal to this oh this x and actually you cannot say that you have to say you cannot make the key itself a, an html string you have to have a sub key within that called markup now that can be html second you want to create a link right so it's a link equals this link and then finally you return dollar page so let me let me re read this to you properly what you're doing is your page you're constructing an empty array called page there are two components in your page list and link the list is hard-coded HTML so you have to when it is hard-coded HTML you have to have a sub key called markup pound sign markup okay uh, I will explain that later and then there's your markup but if it's something is not hard-coded HTML but something returned by one of the Drupal um, functions then you can put it directly as a key let's see if this works I don't know if it will work so reload you got one and two but you did not get link they didn't work I guess I will also have to make link a pound sign markup let's see if this works yes it does work now let me explain what this pound sign markup means hmm? what it really is is that let's create something called dollar list which is an array this itself is a renderable array it has pound theme which means Drupal's theming function that will be markup you are saying this is this is hard-coded markup and then the value of that markup is the pound sign markup so in renderable arrays your attributes are prefixed with pound sign so these are attributes so you basically store this here so that's your list similarly your link is an array that pound theme equal to markup was implied was the default that's why we didn't have to specify it but now we'll specify it and then pound markup is the value of the markup so you're saying what I'm I'm supplying you with a renderable array which is of type markup and here's the markup and you may say hey but what other types are available we will see that in a second okay so now you have dollar page list which is dollar list and dollar page link you will assign dollar link okay something is not right with this oh forgot semicolon here okay 
So what I, I broke it down further. So you're constructing the page from two components and first you're building each of those two components. These keys are totally arbitrary. You can say anything for them. They're just names, exactly. So, but then their value matters. You have to say theme markup and then pound markup is the value of the markup. Now, if you omit theme markup, it assumes markup anyways. So save it, reload it. Oops, doesn't work. <laughs> so it looks like, um, okay, let me see what, what the theme should be. It should be here in development. If you look at the, um, theme registry, you might find. Uh, so theme is HTML and that takes markup. So yeah, uh, I made a mistake. Theme HTML is what I should have said. So the default is not markup, but HTML, which means I'm s giving you hard coded HTML. So not markup, but HTML. That, which means this render array is of type HTML. HTML. Okay, that works. Hmm. And then when you say this render is of type HTML, then you supply the HTML under the attribute called markup, pound sign markup. Okay. Now, let's. Go. So at this point, we have we have dived into the ocean of Drupal theming functions. Okay. So. The right way to do lists in Drupal is not hard coding the uh, or uh, the HTML or even constructing the HTML this way. Uh, for list, what you do is the theme should be called item list, and the items are supplied under the items array, and the array will be will contain one etc save that so this is a different way of doing it and now we, I'm not hard coding the HTML this is great because now other themes and other modules can alter this they can control the process so let's see if this works it does but it instead of uh, instead of ordered list it became unordered list which is fine uh, because items um, item list has a default of ordered list so you can change that default to change it to type ol okay so now if i uh, reload this page it become became There are other values. So how do I, how will you ever know what are, what are the various uh, attributes available? You can find that by going to api.drupal.org and then type theme underscore item list. So which means, so this is like hook system. Uh, when, I, when you're specifying pound theme, you only say item underscore list. But the function that actually implements it is called theme underscore item underscore list. And in there, here's the documentation, which says you can specify items, you can specify title, you can specify type and attributes. Type can be UL or OL. And we never specify title. So just for fun, let's specify title. So you can specify, and again, it you have to prefix it with pound sign because it's an attribute and this this will be list title okay say that and now you reload and it got a title okay if you change the type to unordered list it becomes bullets okay and finally this one theme HTML I am saying L and all this the, there is a better way links have a built-in theme function it's called theme underscore link is it link I think yeah 
So if you use theme underscore link and it takes variables and the variables are an associative con containing keys text path options same as L okay so which means you can say instead of theme uh, theme HTML you say theme link and then these parameters instead of specifying markup you specify the parameters as pound sign text that will be create to do and then pound sign path that will be to do new and now you can get rid of markup so I simply read the documentation let's hope this works mm -mm. no undefined index attributes in link so it requires attributes okay we will specify attributes really what is this theme link okay we'll just say no attributes see what happens no uh, it's still Okay, something is wrong let's check again the documentation mm. theme link theme link text path options and that contains attributes okay oh well, interesting so we have to have pound sign options and that will and that's a, an array that contains now after the first level you don't specify pound sign you just specify the attributes without pound sign and in my case I'm not specifying any attributes I don't know why it requires such a thing it should have a default but we'll see if this works Okay, that worked. Seemed like much more work than reasonable. But the reason why we really have this is because we can specify multiple links. And that is where um, this will be useful. But we'll get to it later. So now let's, uh, if I wanted to specify the same link at the top and at the bottom of the list, I could do this. Link top at the bottom. And then link bottom and now I have the same link at the top and bottom of the list if this was a very long list you would want it in on both places right so if I save that and I reload I got I don't know what that is I don't know why I have the HTML I don't know what that is, but okay. Uh, I, I will ignore that, but at least we got these two. Okay. Okay, so I'll go back to using this same old, the simpler way of doing things, which is theme HTML. And then markup is L, sorry, L, L create to do then path to do new that is so much simpler <laughs> okay okay so once I do that I hopefully don't have any warnings this is good okay at this point we have seen how to use render arrays let me recap basically what you return from your page callback is the complete body of the page as a render array within that I can further simplify this whole thing um, so within that page array you have various components link top the list link bottom and the list is basically theme item list okay we'll get to it uh, we'll, we'll come back to this now let's start actually producing real data so far we are just 
hard coding data, right? So in order to produce real data, you have to have a database table. And in order to have a database table, you need to have a hook schema. And hook schema is supposed to live inside a dot install file. Okay, so what did I just say? I said a lot of things. What we want a new table. This is my Heidi SQL showing this uh, uh, this so if there is a, where's my where's my mm -hmm. hold on if I refresh yeah I got scratch pad this is my database so this is my database and I don't have any table for to do. I want a table here for to do's, for storing to do's, okay? In order to create a table, Drupal is asks you that you must declare hook schema and Drupal will create the table for you, manage it for you. Hook schema, because it is not executed on every request, you are not supposed to put it in dot module file because everything in dot module file is loaded on every request. To avoid that, they say, create a new file called module name, machine name of the module dot install. So let's do that. My mod, oh sorry, it's to do, to do dot install. Is hook schema only implemented once then, since you created table once or? Well, hook schema is written. So the question is, is hook schema implemented once? Any hook in a module is implemented only once per module. Right. But the question should be, is hook schema called only once? Oh. Yes, and the answer is yes, hook schema is called only one, once when the module is enabled uh, or enable that to for the first time enabled. If you enable, disable and enable again, second time enable doesn't call hook schema. So, all right, so this dot install file is another PHP file. So you start with this tag. As you might notice, we open the PHP tags, we never co close them because um, if you close a tag, uh, it will, um, one second, yeah. If you close the tag, um, you might produce an un, unintended output. So that's why you, you don't close the tag. If you if I close the tag and then there is a new line, that new line becomes a part of the output. You don't want that. So therefore don't close. Okay, so in this, I implement hook underscore schema. So the job of hook schema is to build database schema for your module. So I will say, I will go to api.drupal.org as usual and type hook schema. That's your hook, very simple signature of course there is not much of a signature because it returns a lot of interesting data so i say function uh, sorry hook schema and then replace the word hook with my modules machine name and return uh, an array called dollar schema of course it's an empty array right now but i'm going to build it dollar schema the key of the, the first level key of dollar schema is the name of the table. So we will create a table called to do kind of makes sense. And the value is a complex array, it's complex data structure, which has a few things. It has fields, which is an array. It has primary key which I think is also an array because a primary key can be composite, right? More than one columns in it. And it has description. You could have description if you want. And that is a simple string. And in my case, the string will be um, table to hold a list of to-do items. Hmm? And uh, the fields, of course, is important. So we will, let's go in here. 
remember these fields will become the database columns and primary key so basically drupal reads this data structure and creates sql and ddl data definition language from this creates a table from this so the first field should be everything should have a primary key and id so we will say id and that each column is a, again a, an array where you specify the type the type will be okay now at this point i have to cheat a little bit because i don't remember how these things um so the, i had uh, done this before so let me find the find the other one go to file to do dot install yeah there is that yeah so i have it already done here so let, i'll just read it to you so fields uh, the id will be the primary key you specify the descript again you can give description type serial means auto generated integer unsigned true not null true then we will have a title which mean uh, or title column here's the description for it its type is going to be varchar variable characters and the up maximum length will be 255 again it should be not null and default is blank title now we will have a done status done or not done status its type is integer and it will be you know is one or zero it's if it's done it will be one but the default should be zero and then we will also put creation timestamp on it okay and finally we will specify the primary key is an array but only one column id is the primary key so with those things in place I'm just going to copy this whole thing. Copy from here and paste into this. Sorry, I cheated, but it would take too much time to do this. So once again, let me describe. You give the description of the table. You give fields, each field. And then finally, you give the primary key as an array of fields. And the fields themselves, you specify a description type and then a few other extra parameters. All this, how do you specify the schema? You can find out in here. In the hook schema doc documentation, you will, so this is the schema API handbook link. You click on that. And that's the handbook. You look at the schema data structure, data and schema reference will tell you everything you need to know about all this. Okay. So, and data types are there. And so here's everything you, okay. So just follow the links that are on the hook schema documentation page. Okay. All right. So now if I save this, <laughs> you remember I had already enabled my module once. Now that I have, even if I clear cache, it won't help. Hook schema never gets executed once your module has been enabled once. Even if I disable and re-enable it, it won't help. Let me show you. Oh, wait. Have we done, have we enabled to do yet? Yes, we have enabled to do. Yes. So no, this won't work. So if I go and say flush all caches. And look for if I refresh and look for to do, it's not there. If I disable my module, brush minus y this to do and enable it again. I don't think this will also work. Yeah, it didn't. Because it is already an installed module. Disabling is not same as uninstalling. And because it was never uninstalled, it will never get installed uh, one more time. It will get enabled, but not uninstalled. So what we have to do is we have to disable first and also uninstall. Now that we, it is uninstalled, enabling will actually have the effect of installing it as well. Taking a slight second longer. And if you refresh, voila, 
you got to do and to do has the description we gave each column has proper descriptions and the types are what we specified excellent so now we have a table what we, I would like to do is I would like to go to my module and start producing to do's from that table hmm? let's do that um, so instead of this hard coded uh, items list we will produce the items list from a function so I will call it underscore to do again because it's not a hook um, get to do okay I'm calling a function called underscore to do get to do's and it will be the it will produce the list of to do's function underscore to do get to do's again for now if I just return an array bar remember small steps grow your code organically so we, we we don't try to access the database just yet we want to first see if anything works yeah it does work our function call so what we have done is we factored out the process of getting the to do's into its own its own function okay now items um, now we go and read the database. So to read the database, you need to learn the database access API. The database access API is here. Again, api.drupal.org. And there is database abstraction layer. In there, you basically, you have to read this. I have read it, so I will start using it. Um, I say db underscore select specify the name of the table you could do db query but i'm going to do it more interesting way the right way so which select takes the name of the table and the table is to do the second and then you chain this created a unexecuted dynamically built query so you you can still keep building the query you say arrow and then say fields now you say se you selected the table now you select the fields and the fields will be uh, first you have to give the name of the table which is to do again because you could have selected multiple tables that's why you could be joining that's why and then the name and then array of fields and the f array of fields will be okay this is okay hold on hold on let's not do it this way we will have to do db query instead because we want exactly one one single column so we'll do it this way select title from to do okay let's just do that that's the query we execute it and we will say fetch no no sorry fetch uh, fetch one column single column this one this will fetch a single column and we are selecting only single column so this will be all the titles we'll see just to show us that this is actually what we intended we will dpm the titles Let's see what happens back in here we go to to do there's your titles array it's obviously empty so that's why we don't see no to do's so let's put a single to do now we will write, have to write a lot of code if we wanted to create to do's from the UI so we will take the shortcut and we'll use the database administration tool to create some sample to do's id will be auto generated title will be to do one 
done will be zero created will leave zero and again next id will be auto generated oops sorry the second one will be to do two um and the rest we will leave so I'm, I'm basically just manually creating some to do's okay so i have three to do's if i go back to my page reload voila this is my dpm and this is my list it came from the database let me explain what we just did up to this point was just a theming function uh, sorry a page callback that was returning a renderable array then i said instead of hard coding my items i will get them from a function and that function is running a database query and that database query is returning an a an array of titles only just the title not everything else okay so now what if we wanted to actually so at this point uh, those titles are being returned and they become part of the items in the item list okay and we are simply returning now we, we don't have a dpm this anymore we can delete it. okay so with that all you see is to do's and even your anonymous user hopefully can see to do's yeah okay now the next th thing is to create to do. So let's create to do by clicking on it. And when I click create to do, it takes me to to do slash new. But because to do slash new has not been implemented, it shows me to do. The remember it's sub root uh, sub route of the parent route. So it just it just delegates to the parent. So we have to implement the route this one let's uh, duplicate this for now and i will create something called new slash new so this is where this is where we get into forms api because we would like to create a new to do right so the title we will call is create to do page callback now because I said forms API, Drupal has a complete API for creating forms. The entry point into that forms API is Drupal get form. So you don't write, you could write a page callback that builds the form, but that's unnecessary. Drupal has a very sophisticated system for caching forms and validating forms and, um, you know, keeping the form in its uh, session, etc. So you you will never be able to match that so it's better to use the api and your page callback becomes drupal underscore get underscore form okay and to the argument to that form the drupal get form is pay so page argument that is the arguments to this function there are many but the ones that you need to supply is the form id so you will supply only one argument, which will be the form ID. And that form ID we will say is to do new. Okay. So, I mean, I would have liked to put an underscore in front of it, but that's not the convention, right? Because again, my form builder will be named as as so we will create a function called to do underscore new it is convention to have your form builder function same as the form id so because this it will be the name of the function i would like to put an underscore in front of it but that's not the convention so we'll say we'll say to do create form let's say hmm? no let's just to create to do to do create okay 
Now, we create this function. Remember, Drupal get form is the wrapper. It will call our form builder function for us indirectly, but it will do something before and after it to enhance it. So what we have to do now is create the form builder function. So function to do underscore create. Now the, the signature of a form builder function, unfortunately is hard to find, but I will tell you what it is. It's form builder function is always supposed to have dollar form as the first argument and then dollar form state as the second argument, but it is by reference. So you put ampersand in front of it. So first dollar form is by value and form state is by reference. Okay. And then you return your modified dollar form. So you take the dollar form that is given to you, you enhance it, you inject stuff into it, and then you return the modified dollar form. So what goes into it? Well, for now we'll just put a submit button, nothing else. Okay. So we'll say submit, that's just the name of the button, internal name, machine name, and then we'll call it uh, type. Now, just like in a render array, all the first level attributes are prefixed with pound. So type, the type will be submit. There are various types like checkbox, text field, text area, etc. Then the label of a submit button is provided through value, which is very strange. I never understood why, but I didn't like it. Value is something you should be internal. Visible stuff should not be value, but hey, that's what it is. And because it is translatable, because it is user visible, it should be translatable. So you wrap it in T. T is the localization internationalization function. Um, So let's um, let's put the value. Let's say create and just something. Save it. So all we are doing. Let's is read what we just did. We created a uh, a new hook. Sorry, menu item. It its page callback is not something we wrote. Its page callback is Drupal API function called Drupal get form. It in turn, you are giving it a page argument of hard coded value of to do create. So it will, you must have a function by that name because the Drupal get form is going to call that function. And when it calls the function, it will pass a half, half built form, dollar form, which you are supposed to add more items to and then return it. It will also give you a form state, which you are allowed to modify if you wanted to but I, we don't even use it in this case. Inside that dollar form that was supplied to us, we inject submit button, type submit value, create new, and then return the dollar form. Okay, let's save this and run it, see what happens. Well, it, I mean, it doesn't work because to do new, uh, we have to flush the cache, at least for menus, but why not all? There you go. That's the title and that's your button. Okay. If you submit the button, nothing really happens. It just rep it, it presents the form one, once again. So to actually now do stuff, we need a text field that will take the title of the to-do. So let's do that. We say dollar form title array and now the pound title this is the label of the field will be uh, to do title huh okay or item title name of or item name I don't know what oh, there are too many ways to say it let's say an item name Okay, then it's very important to say type. That's extreme. <laughs> I think it should be even higher. 
because type drives everything, I'll put it first. And the type will be text field, correct. And now we have title. Let's see if this, uh, let's start with this. Save, reload. I got item name. Nice. So this, now let's read this again. Type is text field and title is the label. Okay. Now, um, I type something into it and I create new, nothing really happens. It just, because there is no backend to handle this. Or if I even go with empty, it just takes it. What I should do therefore is make it required. Required, true, save. Now, as soon as I said required true, as red star appear again next to it to indicate that it's required. And if I create new, it it won't, the form processing halts, error comes up, item name field is required. That's kind of nice. All we had was pound sign required true. Pretty useful. So, next level is, we are submitting the form. We are not doing anything with it. You need the form to go to a different page. No, no, before it goes to, so the, uh, yeah, we not only we need the form to go to a different page, more importantly, we need the form to actually do something with the data that we are giving it. Which means insert a row into the to-do table. That's the thing we need to do. So how do we do that? We write a submit handler. Submit handler is written by saying function, the name of the form ID, the form ID, this is the form ID, underscore submit. Okay, and this is the submit handler. Submit handler takes both the same parameters, form and form state, except that it gets form by reference. It can get form by reference if it wants. So we do this, okay. For now, we will simply DPM whatever, whatever we are getting, okay. So we will DPM the form and we will DPM the form state. You will pretty soon start, once you do this, you will see the difference between, oops, sorry. You'll see the difference between form and form state. What is the meaning? All right, let's start here. So if I do this, I type something into it. Okay, submit handler executed. It printed the form and form state. Form is something you might expect. It has a title field, it has a submit component, and then it has a bunch of other things, form token, form ID, other things. These were added by Drupal get form. We didn't add that, right? Obviously we didn't, but Drupal get form did. Uh, we will not look at them just yet, but more interesting part is in form state. Form state contains the variable part of the form. Dollar form contains the fixed part, things which are always the same. The same field, same button, same input, same all that. Form ID is same. But for, in form state, you will see highly variable parts, the inputs, validated as well as unvalidated inputs. You know, sometimes you so if I, if I end, uh, uh, hit create new, the form submit handler never executed. You don't see any DPMs. Okay. But if you do, if it passes validation and then you hit, then you do see DPMs because submit handler executed. So in submit handler, there are various things in the form state. There are various things. The most interesting thing is in values, sub key, sub array called values. And you see values are the actual things that were submitted with the form title and submit button as well as the form build id token form id op all these things um but the thing that is of my interest is the value of title because i'm going to create a to do with that title so let's now that we have DPM'd it and we know where to find 
the thing that is of our interest. We can get rid of the DPM and say dollar title equals form state square bracket value values sorry and in that the key title that's your title that's what you want to create a to do for now we use db insert hmm. we insert into the which table to do table and insert has fields and values okay so we say the fields will be array we don't specify uh, we specify title of course the another thing we will specify is the created timestamp and the values will be an array the values will be that the value of title is dollar title and the value of creation timestamp I can get the current timestamp using some PHP function date or time or something but the right way in Drupal is a constant called request time which is it's a constant that is initialized by bootstrap dotting so you use this so basically you are saying my creation timestamp is the time of this request Makes sense, right? So that creates. So now let me, because it's getting long, we should in we should continue like this. And finally, you execute, I guess. Okay. And once you have done that, let's 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 do this and see what happens. Hopefully this will insert. Let's read this again. We extract the value of the title input from form state, and then we in DB insert into the to do table where the field values are provided here. Okay. Let's see if this works. I don't know if it will. Mm. Go to new item name form item one. It didn't say anything. Let's go into the database and refresh this page. There you go, form item one. And look at the created timestamp. It's hard to read, but if I turn on, I right click on it and say, this is a unique timestamp column. It shows 2015 5 May 30th 10 49, which is correct. Okay, so this is very useful. So it's working. Uh, if I go to my to do list page, which means I, I just go to my to do list page, I got form item one. If I create another two to do, form item 2 and go back to my to-do list page I got two of them but of course it, it, it should take us back to the list that would be nice so there is a simple solution what you're supposed to do is in your submit handler when you want to go back to go to another page you simply say in form state you add a new um, key called redirect redirect and you give it the path that it should go to which would be to do so what will this what ha what will happen is you will submit the form form processing will happen which is all this submit handler and validation etc and then finally it will send a 302 redirect uh, temporary redirect back to you to your browser and it will take you to the, to the other page to do page so let's save this and see if it works. Cre create to do form item three, create and it redirected and took us here. Nice. Okay. I think uh, this is a good point to stop um, because we are coming to almost two hours. 
Uh, let's do a recap before we stop. We created our own module. We didn't do much. We just had it had a, a per, uh, hook menu, hook permission, and some page callbacks. I showed you how to use loaders like this, uh, not just positional parameters as percentage sign, but also loaders like node load or we had our own square underscore load, right? And those percentage uh, placeholders get replaced, their, their number, their values get replaced by whatever your loader returns, right? So, and then your page callback is simply supposed to return either a render array or a hard code HTML. Then we went to to do module and there we said, I'm going to build a page, the to-do list from two or three parts, link top, link bottom, and list in the middle. And then each one of them was a themable array, render array, right? Then we created a new to-do form, a, which we, any form in Drupal generally you never return it directly from your page callback. You use Drupal get form as the page callback and your page builder is simply a page builder, not a page callback. It's a form builder, sorry. Your form builder is not a page callback. It is the argument to your page callback, namely Drupal get form. And the reason why we do, do it that way is because Drupal get form does a lot of bookkeeping, a lot of other things, other stuff that you need like form, injecting form ID, form token, blah, 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 caching, so many things. So now, so that your form builder becomes very simple. It simply takes a form array, adds some form components into it and returns the form array. Finally, when the form is submitted, the form ID underscore submit is the default submit handler, which never, which will not even get called if the required fields are not present. So then finally, when the submit handler does get called, you can extract the submitted values from dollar form state values array. And you have to use the key within this that matches the key for the form component. So this title and this title have to match. You extract, you got your title value and then you used db insert part of the database abstraction layer API to do the insertion. Finally, to bring you back to the list of to-dos, you say form state redirect equals the new path. And at the end of form processing, Drupal will redirect you back to that page. And of course that page is showing you the list of to-dos. All right, at this point, I will stop recording. Hope this was useful. Hold on one second.